here hosting these seminars this summer to just kind of promote some of the activities that the Housing Authority offers. We do have home improvement loan programs which are described in the brochures on the front table. And tonight we're going to have Jake Tomzager talk about hardwood floor refinishing. Jake was an intern in our office last year uh, while he was getting a degree from the university and while he's going through the university he worked for Prime Hardwood Floor Refinishing. And uh, he won everybody over in our office with his personality, so I'm hoping he'll show a little bit about that tonight. So I'm going to give it to Jake. <laughs> Alright, so yeah, my name is Jake Tonsager and I'll just get into PowerPoint. If I think it's better to set it up this way. If there's any questions throughout the entire PowerPoint, just raise your hand and we'll handle them right there. I know there's going to be a lot of questions, so at the end there's going to be a half hour of pure questions. Because different finishes, different colors, people have a lot of time. So who am I? Jake Tonsager. I am a year ago I graduated from the University of Minnesota in Housing Studies and Sustainability. Um, I love wood, and I've been working for my boss, Dick Anderson. I love Prime Harbor Floors, even though I'm not supposed to plug the company, but that's what I work for. And we together, I think right now, is trying to work with them. we refinished 392 houses. So you may look at me and think that I'm young, but I've done a lot of refinishing. So. Tell me how you got that job. <laughs> it was actually on Craigslist. I was in college and I was looking at Craigslist. I had worked at UPS for six years um, in the evening as a part-time supervisor. That pays my bills, but I wanted to have a job where I learned a new trade because I've done sheetrock, I've done construction, and I wanted something a little more technical. Ideally, I'd like to get into carpentry, but Prime Harbor Floors had an offering up there for... Sorry. <laughs> for manual labor and I emailed him and there were 65 people that emailed him since he put up the post and he said I don't really know where to go with this. I said alright well what are you doing right now? He said I'm refinishing the house on the campus of the U of M. So I said alright if I skip class and come work for you for a day and you like my work ethic will you hire me? So I worked for him for 10 hours and actually skipped my night shift at UPS and he hired me on the spot so that's how I got that job. It is a good story. But. All right, so refinishing your hardwood floors, I'm basically gonna talk about how you as a homeowner would do it. I can also, I'm gonna show the machines that we're gonna use, but everything that I'm gonna talk about is something that you could rent and that you could do yourself. So, start to finish what it takes to turn a floor from this into this. And sorry if I'm in the way. All right, so getting, your, getting started, doing it yourself. Every single tool that's up here you can rent, like I said, I'm gonna talk about the steps, I'm going to talk about the colors of stain, the types of finish, what you can do if you have pets, whether it's $100 a gallon for poly or it's $5 a gallon for poly, and what's going to be the benefit of either of those. So tools. On your top right is the belt sander. We like to call it the big machine. We're not that professional. Um, all it is is a large belt sander, a drum sander. It, the machine itself weighs probably 220 pounds. And that weight is to help level out the floor. So if you have an uneven floor, this is the machine that's going to do the most work in grinding off the finish. Um, and like I said, this is a belt. You can come and see it afterwards. Next is the edger. So the big machine is going to handle all the large surface area. You could do 90% of this room with the big machine or the belt sander. And the edger, which takes a pad like this, goes along the entire edge of the room. And I'll show photos of all this as well. Um, third is the scrapers. You'll use those for the corners because obviously a round disc cannot fit into a square corner. And then uh, second to the last step is the buffer, which you use before you coat, and the palm orb, which you also use around the edges because the buffer cannot get to the edge. So sanding four, step one. Like we do with our company, and I think most homeowners should as well, you want to keep the dust in the location where you're sanding. You don't want it to go through your entire house. So plastic off the livable area, just cheap plastic and painter's tape works. Um, then the question comes to keeping your trim and baseboard. Like on this, this trim right here, there's no base, a ba or sorry, there's no shoe. So that's the baseboard. Then there's usually a quarter round or a shoe that goes on as the finishing touch. It's easier for the hardwood floor finisher if at least the shoe is removed. If you want to remove the shoe and the base, then it's even better because you get all the way to the Like most homes in Bloomington, which are all 1040s, 
which you guys have a ton of, 1040 being the square footage of most homes in the city. Um, everyone has hardwood floors throughout, so that hardwood floor goes underneath the trim. If you sand twice and you don't take off the shoe or the baseboard, then you're going to get a little bit of a lip. So the floor will be at this level, and obviously where the original floor was and where the trim and base are, it's going to be at this level. So ideally, rip off the shoe, rip off the base, but mostly if you're just going to refinish it for the first time, I'd rip off the shoe just so you can get really close. And then obviously debris and personal items removed, especially art, picture frames, pictures, mirrors. We've had a lot fall, um, which my boss doesn't like to pay for. All right, so getting started, this is the first step after you plastic everything off, is the walk behind belt sander. It's this one that uses this drum. And all it is, it's a 220 volt machine, so it hooks up to your washer or your oven if you have an electric oven. It's got a bag that attaches at the top of a long hose, which shoots uh, sawdust into. Um, there's some companies that have dustless equipment, so they'll have a vacuum hose that hooks up to that attachment, which is very good for keeping the dust down, but still you're going to get sawdust and uh, dust all throughout the area. So this is just a walk behind machine, which you can rent at any rental center. All it is is it's one lever on top. You push the lever down, that drops this belt sander onto the floor, and the machine actually pulls itself. So there's a lot of resistance in your arms from this 220 pound machine revving at, I don't even know, 3,000 RPMs per minute. So it's, uh, it's a pretty powerful machine. Um, I guess I'll get into that. So say you had a really deep scratch in your floor or your floor is uneven in one spot from a previous sanding, or maybe somebody gouged out a half of an inch, and you, not a half, a quarter of an inch, and you need to get down to a sandable level. With the big machine, what you can do is you can cross cut. You should always be going with the grain when you're sanding anything in life, but if you need to cut down deeper and deeper in the floor, instead of running it straight along these boards and digging down on a certain path, you cross cut to even out that area going both ways, and then you go over the floor again with the grain. So that, you use that technique if you have a uh, large scratch. Uh, so yeah, three times you use this machine in the entire process. The first, and then I'll go through the next step, and then two more times after that. And we'll go to the next step. So edging. Um, sands the edge with a belt sander. What the belt sander can't, and that's the edge. It's very fast moving, very hard to control. It takes a lot of time to get the hang of it. And uh, again, you have to go with the grain, and you have to have supreme control over this machine. What's tough about it is you see this guy right here bending over. You can go on your knees, but your knees are going to slide because it's a freshly sanded floor. Your shoes are going to slide because it's a freshly sanded floor. Everything slides because it's a freshly sanded floor. So you have this machine that's moving very, very fast, and you have to slow it down because, say you're going along the, say this table is the edge of the floor, and you're going along it, and you slip, and the machine comes out. Now you have a huge gouge in the floor that you then have to go back over with the edger or the big machine. And it's just a lot of hassle. It took me probably three months to be able to completely master that, working with my boss. And he didn't give me the raise until I was able to master it, so it's also backbreaking. That's this is the hardest part. Sanding is the hardest part of refinishing the floors. We do a job a week. Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday are the worst days. Half a day Wednesday and Thursday and Friday are cake days. We come in, we coat, and we leave after three hours. So, uh, so step number four. After you got the large area, you got the edges. Now you're going to need to scrape the corners. This round disc. And definitely this cannot reach into the corners. They do have machines like this. It's a multi-tool. Craftsman now makes one for $90. We have one that was made in Germany. This one, actually, that's like $600. But we actually never use it. We always use hand scraping because that gets close. It's cheap. Blades are cheap. And uh, gets the job done. Again, you're going to want to go with the grain. You never want to go against the grain. And with scrapers, you have to be very careful as well because if you twist it, off of that level plane, you're going to gouge right down into the floor as well. All right, so sanding the floor, like I said, you use the big machine three times, or the belt sander three times. Use the edger three times. Depending on 
the severity of the scratches in your floor. My house, when I purchased it in South Minneapolis, was built in 1914, and when I bought it in 2008, the floors had never been refinished the entire time. So I spent 13 hours myself with my boss sanding the floors in that house. We had to go from 24 grit to 40 to 60 to 80, and that's where I put down here. All grits subject to floor condition, scratched, water stained, 24, 40, 60, 80. Um, again, with the edger, you only have to do it twice, so 40 grit, and then an 80 grit, belt sander, 40, 60, 80. You always want to vacuum between your grits as well, because obviously if you sand with a 24, and there's going to be pieces of 24 sand on that floor, so the 40 grit belt sander is going to pick up those 24 pieces of sand and put 24 grit gouges in the floor instead of the 40, so make sure you always vacuum. And then lightly scuffed floors. Say you have a floor that's less than five years old and there's just surface scratches on it, nothing too deep, you can't see any dark lines or dark marks. A really affordable option is to have a buff and coat. That's used, I'll show you the buffer in a little bit, but it's just buffing the large area, palm more in the corners, and then you put down a new coat of poly which will fill in a lot of the surface cracks and scratches. And I feel myself going fast, so if I am and I'm skipping something, let me know. So this would be after the three sands with the belt sander, 40, 60, 80, and the two edger runs, 40 and 60, and you palm orb the corners and scrape the corners. You buff the entire floor using a round buff. We use a round buff, there's other machines called 3DSs where you can rent those as well at the Home Improvement Center. They have three individual discs like this that are like random palm orbs. A random palm orb spins and it vibrates, so it, you can go any direction on the floor and it won't scratch it. And that's what a 3DS is. We don't like to use them as much because they leave circular tail marks, pigtails we call them in the floor, which a lot of orbs do as well. They leave those pigtail marks in the floor. So we have best luck using the method that I'm telling you. Um, but again, depending on uh, the previous scratches in the floor, 80 or 100 grit, we mostly use 100 grit on the buffer. It's a large disc like this, and it covers a lot of area quickly. That'll probably take a room like this 30 minutes to buff it. So step number seven, you want to Get the edge using a palm orb or a square buff. The palm orb is more efficient because it rotates and it moves a lot faster than just the vibrating square buff, palm orb. Um, so you use the palm orb on the long surfaces and the square buff in the corners to get where you scraped. Um, and after the trial, like I said, of expensive tools that claim to do the job, this is the winning combination. There are plenty of edgers out there that sell for $700, but a $60 palm orb is gonna do the job way better. Which is actually what you can sand your entire floor with, if you have enough time and patience. And you wanna spend a lot in grit. So you're done with sanding, that's, that's it for sanding. You're completely finished. After you do that final vacuum, go ahead. I've got a couple of questions back when you had the, uh, the big sander. Yeah. How, what do you do when you're switching from one lane to the other without like, putting gouges or scrapes in it. We thought about the most important stuff. And yeah. then uh, the other thing, if it weighs 250 pounds, those things come apart? Yep, so the neck comes off, that's like five pounds. The bottom, which is all aluminum, comes out. The electric motor comes off of that, which is connected by two belts. And uh, that's it, the motor is the most expensive. And in this weather is the hottest. So you can't touch it for probably 45 minutes after you get done sanding because it's so hot. But yeah, you're right. You always want to move from right to left when using the big machine or the belt sander. Um, what you want to do, what we do, we mostly do inch and a half floors. So that's your old school. That's your every house in the city of Bloomington almost, unless it's been new, if, unless it was made past 1950 probably, then they started using two and a quarter inch boards. But inch and a half boards are the real skinny one. We go an entire board each run. So this is about this wide, right? It obviously probably has four, five, six boards in the belt path. We go over one board every single time. So that far right edge of the belt 
is always cutting the hardest finish off. These are sanding a little bit more and more per board. And then when you, uh, the only reason we do that is because when you get to the end of the life of the belt, instead of scrapping out the entire belt, all you do is flip it. And now you have the sharpest side and the dullest side over there. So on a floor like this, this is two and a quarter inch, if not a little bit more because it's fake, which I don't like. But, um, when you're going down your lanes, you go straight down. When you're at the end, don't even worry about not coming straight back. Go a board over as soon as you can and come straight back. When you're at this side, move a board over, go all the way down. And the biggest thing with the belt sander is the fact that you have this thing grinding your floors intensely. You're the one that levers up before it gets to the wall. If you hit the wall, if you stop, you're going to have one second you'll have a gouge this deep in your floor that you won't be able to get out. And that's where the technique comes in. And that's what scares most people about doing it themselves is if you screw up one time, you have a gouge that deep. Good? Go ahead. So you're walking backwards? You're walking forwards with a cord over your shoulder and you're kicking the cord off to the side as you're walking backwards. And I've ran over a cord before too. So, yeah. Any other questions? So you're saying you're switching one board each time. So the boards in the middle of the floor, let's say if you're covering six at a time, they, those boards might get six passes. Exactly. But when you get to the edge of the wall, that last one is only getting one pass? Yeah, but still the one pass is sufficient. It's just, um, and then you flip around. Okay. On the edges, sorry, I need to describe this better. Um, on the edges, say we were doing the edge of this room and it were a straight line, it didn't have these little coves in it. The belt itself is going to be on the right side of the machine and there's housing over here against this wall. So that means you're going to have four boards that aren't being sanded. So I'm going to walk down this entire length of the wall, down, I'm going to come the entire length back. But I'm only going to do a room like this, I'd split up into three sections. So I'd start over there, I'd go to where maybe the chairs start, I'd do against the wall there. Then I'd come back, I'd do from this cove to this wall to the edge of the wall. And then I'd come back, I'd do from here to this corner right there. So that way, you're going over it more than once. And then you flip around and you do the edge this way and this way. So you're hitting both sides of the machine. Yeah. Can't believe I forgot. That's some very good questions. Very good questions. All right, so you're done with sanding. Let's move on to every homeowner's worst nightmare. Selecting a finish. What do you want? Do you want stain? Look at all these stains. Do you want an oil rub finish, which take, takes years but turns out great? Do you want oil poly, water-based poly, which is more environmentally friendly? Do you want soy-based poly, which is very environmentally friendly? Do you want to match the trim? What do you want to do? And this is my favorite part, because homeowners squirm, and it seems like nobody ever decides until the day we're supposed to do it. So that's the biggest, that's the biggest problem. And I have some examples up here that I, I guess I could just walk through them now, and you can come see them after. Uh, mostly just the stain cards, which you can look at. But I mean, you have boards like this tiger wood, which would be a darker stain. You have hickory, a darker oak, a lighter oak. Whether you want that oak floor to be glossy or satin, it all depends. Um, like with walls, a satin floor or a satin wall is going to show less marks or wear than a high gloss finish or a glossy wall. You're going to see the fingerprints on a glossy wall. You're going to see every fingerprint, scuff, water, moisture mark on a glossy floor. So we use satin poly probably 90% of our coats. We also use uh, poly itself 90% of the time that we finish a floor, which I'll get into on the next slide. And my advice is to stick to the character of their home and keep it classic. Classic would be a polyurethane finish. Uh, like I said, 99% of our work, it was just 90, now it's 99. Um, for the first coat, we use either a dry fast sealer, which is a poly, it's just a little bit more expensive and it seals the wood very quickly within five hours and you could coat again after that. Um, 
You can use a dry fast sealer, which is more expensive, or a thinner poly. So get some polyurethane and thin it out with some mineral spirits for your first coat. You want something that's going to soak deep into the floor. So instead of using a thick poly that's going to sit on top, it's more gelatinous, you want something that's going to penetrate. Um, one thing you can do to get a stain or a poly to penetrate as well, it's called popping the finish. And what that is is you're applying water over the entire floor to pop the grain of the wood, just like opening up the pores on your face, and then that'll let the poly or the dry fast sealer get into those pores and penetrate deeper into the floor, giving you a longer finish or a deeper finish and a better color. Uh, popping the finish, it's kind of tough to do for your first time. It's good to practice maybe in a spot, but you have to be really careful that you don't put too much water in one spot, that you don't let it soak in. You're just applying it to the top and then wiping it off right away. You're not letting water sit on the floor. If you do that, then you're going to have water spots, which you're trying to sand out anyways by sanding your floor. Um, the application, what we use, we used to use a T-bar when I first started. And a T-bar is made by Bona, which is a floor um, company. They sell sanders, they sell finish, they sell everything. And a T-bar is just a bar. It's a T. Uh, so you have your pole, and then it connects to a flat bar. that You have a lamb's wool or a uh, fibrous fabric on the end of, and then you just bar out poly. So you're pushing poly over the floor the entire time. It's kind of what they use on gym floors because they're large areas. They pour down a bunch of poly, and they work it back and forth. What we've used for four years since my first year and was the rave new technique was a super expensive roller, a paint roller. And now we've been using that forever. Everybody swears by the paint roller. It's the easiest way to do it. You get less bubbles in your finish, air bubbles. Um, yeah, it's easy and it's cheap. So we use a simple 97 cent brush for the edges in the corner and a $2 roller. Um, one thing with the roller, you have, Try to buy a more expensive roller because then it won't have as many fibers in it. We also run the rollers down with our bare hands like you would if you're painting your own house to get those fibers out so they're not going to end up on your wall or your floor. So with the roller and brush, slow and steady, it's going to self-level a little bit. Um, you're going to apply it with the grain as well like you see. And you don't want to go too fast because that's going to create air bubbles in your floor. The first coat, the second coat, I'll get into this later doesn't matter at all. Slop it on because you're buffing in between those coats before your final coat. Um, I'll give an example of this room. Say I were coating it by myself. I'd want to first find out where my exit is so I don't poly into this corner and then I have to walk over the entire floor. So I'd start in this corner. I would go with a brush and do the entire edge up to about here. And then I'd drop my brush right there I pick up my watering can or whatever you're using to apply the poly, pour it down, brush the entire distance, I get to this mark, I then brush the edge all the way back to say here. Again, run down. You always want to keep a wet edge. A wet edge is very important in poly because if it's not a wet edge, what you're going to do when you go over it with that roller or that brush is that brush is going to dig down and leave the lines in the poly, which is a very soft, wet substance. So. And important, wear a mask to avoid getting high. In college, I didn't really wear a mask, but now I do. What do you that was my one joke. Between the, the sanding, what's the prep work after you've done all your sanding before you call it? Is there, do you have to mop the floor? Or? Yeah. Preparation for coating the floors. Dust, cloth mop the surface, surface to remove fine particles. That's just like a uh, microfiber cloth that you use on your car to take wax off after you've waxed it. And um, we use a, a really, really expensive vacuum that is very powerful, but a shop vac works too. Um, we also have a felt padded wand. So the bottom of the, the wand itself has a felt pad, which picks up a lot of those fibers. And what you want to do when you're vacuuming as well, you want to start the same way you would coating in the corner and work your way out. Vacuum all the corners first, all the edges first. And then you go and you draw the end of your vacuum up. So your away edge is touching the floor and your leading edge is tipped up to let the particles slide underneath as you pull. And then you pick up anything else, the dust, whatever, um, with the cloth mop. And you don't necessarily have to, but some people also like to dust the entire house. But you're also sanding between coats, so it's not important to dust 
uh, until you're putting on your final coat. All right, so you just polyed the floor, you stained the floor, and then polyed it. Whatever you did to the floor, whatever your labor's decision was, now you're going to buff the entire surface with a 100 grit buffer, and you're going to uh, orb the corners. So just like this, this is a polyed floor that we did. Afterwards, you take the buffer with a 100 grit pad, you run it over the floor. You can go any direction with that as well, but it's nice to stick with the grain. Sometimes it'll leave scratches, but you're not trying to scratch the floor. You're trying to scratch the first layer of poly or the first layer of sealer. You're trying to take off those pieces of dirt or those hair particles or whatever it's there. That's what you're trying to get with this buff. And then palm the edge and corners. And then, thank you, vacuum and cloth mop the entire floor. So now you're ready for your second coat of poly. Don't slop it on like the first as much, but you could still give it a liberal coat. It's not going to silk up as much. It's going to go a lot faster. But again, you want to make sure it's even. You want to make sure it's debris free. And that's a roller method right there. He's doing it incorrectly because he has bare foot, bare feet. That's another thing. I and my boss don't tend to wear shoes when we're coating a floor. Um, you don't want to have any oil touch the wood, so you don't know what's going to be on the bottom of your shoes. We just go in our socks because then there's a barrier between the oil with our feet or the moisture and the floor. And we don't go with shoes because, like I said, you could have stepped in gum on the way in or whatever you might have stepped in. We also use booties sometimes, but socks are the new rage. So. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So after the second coat, what do you do again? You're going to buff it over the corners. You're going to use the same 100 grit. You're going to run, run it over the entire floor. You're going to orb the corners. And like before, you're taking out all the hairs or the pieces of dirt or any imperfection in the finish that you just laid down. Mind you, each coat of poly has 24 hours to dry before you re reapply. Different finishes will take different times. Um, just depends on really what you want. And actually, most males don't, but read the directions on the back of the can because they're correct. So. so now after you vacuumed again, you dusted again. I personally like to dust the entire place, all window sills, tops of fan blades, door frames, before you put on the final coat. And then you're giving two vacuums. You're going really slow with your vacuum and you're coming back after you cloth mop the floor just to make sure that nothing, nothing's in it and then hopefully you'll get a glossy finish like that. And uh, you really, really, really want to take your time with this final coat, getting down on your hands and knees. I'll do edges, and my boss will do the large area when we're putting on poly. I'll do an edge up, an edge up, I'll pour a line for him, and then I'll literally get down on my hands and knees and crawl along the entire floor on my knuckles, because you don't want to put your palms on the floor because they have oil and just get down and you look for every imperfection, a missed spot, a hair, because that's gonna show in the final. If you have a missed spot in the first and second coats, it's all right because you're doing another coat for the final. And then it's there for life. So that's the final product. This is the house we just did two weeks ago. Refinish. Um, that's your inch and a quarter, or inch and a half oak, and that's just a standard poly. That's what most, uh, most houses do. This would be the satin. Yeah. It does look pretty glossy though with the light. This is a high gloss. Yeah. Still a little wet too, I think. I mean, these are some photos I got offline. And then now it's question time. This is off my boss's website, primehardwoodfloors.com. And I have business cards up here, but any other questions as well as examples of flooring up here? Um, if anybody wants to talk about engineered or pre-finished or whatever. What are these tack rigs? Tack rigs? Uh, yeah, it's the same as the microfiber cloth. They're, they work. Yeah, definitely. I wish they pick up a lot more, but I think the old school guys use the tack rigs. Definitely. <laughs> How do you go about evaluating the stains you've got in your hardwood floor or likely to come out or they're going to remain? Okay. Um, really, you can't tell 100% until you sand that first time. 
Um, with water stains, if you see a water stain, the darker it is, the more likely it's not going to come out. The lighter it is, the more likely it'll come out. Um, it depends. It really just depends. If you yourself want to, in that spot, take a piece of sandpaper and rub, you can really find out there too if you don't want to, if you know whether I want to refinish all the floors or not. Um, but yeah, it's situational for sure. Can you get separation between the boards and the Filler. Um, you can, don't buy your standard filler. Go to a hardwood floor and supply company and buy a filler, whether it's, it matters if it's red oak, white oak. Um, you really want to find the type of wood you have, which could be tough for some people. It's a guessing game. A red oak is going to be more pink, a white oak is going to be more white. And then you buy that correct filler, you're going to trowel it on if you want, if you have cracks everywhere, like I did in my house. If you just have small cracks, you can use a putty knife and you put it in. And then you do that before, you, um, before your third coat. So you want to sand that off after it's dried, and then you buff on top of it, and then you're ready to coat. The wood filler goes on after two layers of poly? Is that what you're saying? Nope, after the second sanding. Or even the third sanding. It depends on how much, if you're going to trowel finish the entire thing, it hardens pretty hard. So you're going to want to put it on after the second sanding with the belt sander before your 80 grit. Um, because the trowel, it's going to get into the cracks, but it's also going to leave a thin film over the entire floor. So. Maybe you answer this question. I didn't quite get your conversation here with the lady, but if you got one room that's really had a lot of traffic and wear, wear like a kitchen, but your whole house, the green floor was all hardwood, you know, laminated, hard maple. Yep. Would you do the whole house, or is there a separation in levels between? No. So there's no barrier in between the kitchen. <laughs> then it gets tough. If you have, say, you have one bad bedroom and it lines up to carpet, you could refinish or you could buff and coat that room. You can buff and coat a situation like yours, like say this is the kitchen, that's the living area, that's completely fine, but the kitchen is super scuffed. You can do it, but you're still gonna see a visible line where it enters the rest of the house. And in your case, with the pre-finished, it's gonna show a lot because the pre-finish is a baked on finish versus poly, which is a rolled on drying in the open air finish. I have never used, I've never seen my boss either. If there are water stains, what we do, we rip it out and we lace in. Lacing in is, say we had an area like this that has a water stain. We, on this board that's black, after we cut it out, we'd go back to here. Then the next board, we'd go back to here, next board up to here, and we'd stagger it the entire way. And I'd say 99% of the lacings that we do to replace a bad spot, you can't ever tell that we were there, there was a stain there. So that's a really, it's labor intensive, but it's worth it if you have a big, large water stain. Like I had one right in front of my kitchen, right in front of my sink, and I didn't want to put it rug there. So we ripped it out, and it looks a lot better now. And I was able to match with 85-year-old uh, wood. So. What was it? Uh, we don't, we, if we're going to stain, we stain and then we poly, but there are tinted polys that you can get. And uh, like Minwax has a poly shades that you could use. So what's tough with that, I don't know if you've ever used it, but if you're using a tinted poly, you really have to make sure that your strokes, whether it be your brush strokes or your roller strokes are even and consistent. Make sure you're not pressing down too hard because the color is within the thickness of the poly. So if you pull and drag a spot, you're going to have, say, a red mahogany swatch here, and then a lightly red mahogany swatch where you screwed up. So, yeah, definitely. Jake, what do you do to evaluate if a floor can stand in the um, Usually in older homes, you pop a corner of the shoe and base. And like I said, if there's a slope up, because a lot of most people only pop off the shoe, they never pop off the baseboards. If there's a slope up, you'll see that it's once. If it's a deep slope, you'll see that it's twice. Or you can go to a closet where there will usually be the edge of a board in a closet. There'll be a gap in between that edge of the board and the wall. And you can look down and feel where the tongue or the groove is to see how much thickness you have left. So. How many times can a floor be Three. 
for three quarter inch boards like this, depending on wear and tear, if you have light wear and tear, six times. If you have kids and dogs, I'd say three. So three to six, depending on the wear. Three to six times? Mm -hmm. That's why it's such a great product and a good investment because it's, for me, hardwood is not laminate or pre-finished, but hardwood is a great investment because it can last. Like I said, my house is how old and I'm sure you, people here have old houses, so same floors. What would they charge for, for square foot? I did mine one time and I'd never do it again. <laughs> yeah, um, it really depends. If you get a company, I, I don't want to talk about um, no, it's it averages I'd say between 250 for your back door, van toting Craigslist ad, uh, floor installers to 450. Um, my boss is right around three. So you can talk to me after about my company. If you want. <laughs> I did that one time and boy, I tell you, it is a job. Yeah. Jake, what percentage are you installing or are you refinishing? Are you doing, you said both. Depends on which city you're talking about. Right. Depends on which city. In, within the city, we do mostly, we do 90% refinish. But we work for a lot of contractors as well. So last week we did 2,000 square feet of four inch walnut. It just depends, really. But mostly we do refinishing. What, uh, what do you do if uh, to protect if it comes up against carpet, to keep the carpet from getting all slapped up. I'm just kind of curious as to how you do it. Your eye. Yep, you're running, uh, say you're running the belt sander. Uh, that last picture I had was right up against carpet. So this carpet, you see how there's this trim board that runs uh, against, or perpendicular, I should say. Uh, that trim board, a lot of houses don't have that, but that's a great board to have because you know exactly where to stop. Again, with the big machine, it's got one wheel in back, two wheels in front. If I'm coming back right here, I'm still, I haven't sanded this much of the floor because I can't let that back wheel drop because if I do, you're going to gouge the floor. So on a floor like this or where you have a tile or a carpet, you're going to ore ball this with the palm orb and hand, hand scrape it first, then orb afterwards, and then even just take a piece of sandpaper on your fingers and run really close. Especially if you have two different boards, like this corner, where the grain runs this way, the grain runs that way. You're doing that with hand scrapers and then a piece of sandpaper on your hand. So. And then the buffer can go over it all. Yeah. For dogs, um, do you recommend, a, is there a product that's better um, as, as far as the finished product? Absolutely. Um, I'm not a rep for Bona, but Bona traffic, it's $100 a gallon. So it's expensive, but this is what they use in all commercial spaces where every single, if we have a person that really cares about the floor and they want to protect and they have a dog, they're going to use Bona traffic every single time. Or if you have a bunch of young kids and it's in a kitchen, Bona traffic is recommended. You're just going to have to you're not going to have to refinish it as much. It's a water-based sealer. So with that being said, you have to sand down to the bottom. You have to re-sand the entire floor if you want to refinish it. You can't do a buff and coat with a water-based poly. You probably write that down if you want. Um, that's why oil-based poly is best, and that's why I like it the most, because say five years down the road, that dog and those kids have torn up the kitchen. You can do a buff and coat and take out 90% of the scratches. You could not do that with this, but Bona Traffic is the way to go. I have a dog, and I've only just used normal poly in my house. But that's because I have free access to equipment, though, so I can refinish it whenever I want. You got some non-professional advice about not using a belt sander, but instead run a machine that's got three pivoting orbs? Yep, three, yes. Yep, he said it, you almost can't. You know, gouge the floor. Away. Oh, you can't at all. Paying attention. Nope. Is, is that a safer uh, piece of rental equipment than using the big belt fan? Oh, for sure, absolutely, yeah. Or there's also square buffs, which are large, like the square buff for the palm that you hit the corners with. There's large square buffs that you buy just a sheet of sandpaper and you set it on. It's going to take a lot more time. You imagine something like a belt sander that's rotating versus a vibrating palm orb or a spinning 3DS machine. 
it's going to take a lot more time. And the only bad thing about that 3DS machine, which we have one and we've used, is like I said, the pigtails. So you're not going to see them from this level, or if you have a lot of uh, natural light, you're going to see most of your scratches in the sanding. If you have a room with no windows or one window and a ceiling fan light, you can use whatever you want because you're not going to see any of the scratches. But the 3DS leaves a lot of little pigtails everywhere. So. This may fall outside of the true hardware question, but can you comment on refreshing a parquet square floor that's just become dull in places and from it's tables? Or buff and coat. You take the buffer. You can't take much. I mean, how much can you take? Depends on how it was. Uh, traditional parquet, are you talking a parquet like this where it's probably three and a quarter inch boards? You can take just as much off this as you could a normal floor. A normal floor just runs like that, that's all. It's just a different sanding method because it is parquet and you have varying grains. You're going to spend a lot more time sanding it. But a buff and coat would be the best option if you just have minimal scratches in it. And all that is is using the large buffer with 100 grit running it over, palming the corners, and then putting coats of poly on top of that. Okay. The buffer <coughs> grit, is that a screen or is that actually sandpaper? Both. You can use screens. We use screens. Uh, we also use sandpaper, so it just, it just depends. Screens are more expensive, but they let the debris through into the felt bad that's on the bottom versus the sandpaper, which just pushes it out. So. And the good thing about screens is it lets it into that felt and then the vacuum that's on top can suck it out more, but sandpaper works just as well. Yeah. I had a friend tell me that the poly peel over time, and I question whether it's, is that product, poor product? Poor product, poor application, both. Yeah, it could be both. They mentioned Minwax. Is that something to avoid? Yeah, we've never, I've never used Minwax. I'd never use anything that you could buy in Home Depot. Um, go to a hardwood floor and supply company, Musa, Lawn Musa Floors, Florence Northwest, off 694 in the North Metro. Uh, I'm trying to think what's down here. I'm not sure. Uh, my boss is from Plymouth. What was the name of that last thing you mentioned? Uh, floors Northwest. Floors Northwest. And Lawn Musaf. He's a pretty funny guy. Uh, he's got a website as well. Yeah. Um, in order to save Yeah, but the sanding is where all the money comes in because, I mean, that's the hard work, right? The, I mean, I don't, I don't even know what my boss would say to that. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, he's pretty open to anything, but that is where all the money and all the hard work is. Like, like I said, it's just slopping it on. So. Plus, I think if you go that far, you might just want to have us do it anyways. This is me. Yes? So once you've got the floor done, how do you keep it up looking really nice? Do you just like, use the torpor all the time? Um, you can go to Bona. Bona also sells microfiber cloth pads mm -hmm. on a wand, on a T-bar. That's what I use in my house. I just bone it with the microfiber cloth, which you can, Swiffer sells those too, I think. Um, don't, 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 don't mop wood floors. Don't mop wood floors. Never. Um, what I use is, uh, what is it called? I just washed my floors the other day. It's Murphy soil. Murphy soil. Get down on your hands and knees and scrub it in and wash it. And all I, yep, it's a third of a cup to a gallon, I think, or a fourth even. And all I do is I wipe over it and then immediately right after I do one wipe or however bad the stain is, you take a dry towel and you wipe after that. And I do that probably like four times a year, because I also live with three other men. But uh, yeah, just use a microfiber cloth to get the hair and dust. Tell people to take off their shoes. This is Minnesota. Yeah. What do you do with uh, squeaky floors? Hey. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's products, well, it depends if the floor below them is exposed. If the floor below it's exposed, you can drill through. Just make sure your screw's not three inches and it goes through the bottom of the floor or the top of the floor. Um, there's also kits that you can get that you could screw through the floor 
and then use plugs, but obviously you're going to see the plugs. Um, if we were refinishing a floor, what we might do in one spot, because we're sanding down anyways, is we might pop one board where it's bad, and or we might pop one board where it's bad and then nail in that row and take an epoxy, which you can drill a 16th inch hole down in the floorboards, squirt this epoxy in, which is like a window or door foam, which you spray in and it expands. It expands in that entire uh, loose area where it's obviously squeaking, but then you get into more money. It's not that expensive though. Uh, we've only used it probably five times. People just, some people can handle the squeaks and some people can't. The epoxy is what I'd do, because then you're not going to have any visible evidence of it, except for that 16th inch hole that'll get filled with poly anyways and blend in. Yeah? What uh, percentage of the boss's business is from people that started on their own, screwed it up, and then called you guys? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd probably only say two jobs in five years that I've helped them with. Um, do you charge extra for that? <laughs> <laughs> Depends on how bad they screwed it up, whether they're edger digs or belt sander digs in the floor. So, yeah, not too many, not too many. But I know a lot of people, I mean, you can easily do it yourself. You just make sure you read up on it or download this PowerPoint. <laughs> this PowerPoint presentation will be on the city website and as a webcast. Yeah. Yep. Oh, yep. You just don't want to mix up grits. You don't want to do the 60 grit and then do the 24 grit, because then you're going to have to go back and do the 40 and 60. Yeah, you can. I just do it how we switch off. Either I edge and he does the belt sander if he's tired, and if he's not tired, he'll do the edge. But you can do it. We do them at the same time. So. Just make sure you vacuum and make sure you uh, switch grits. How do you tell if a floor just needs a buff? Um, that it can just stand up Say like the scratches at your feet. If these scratches at your feet are dark like this, that means that they're underneath the finish. If they're lighter scratches or you get down and you're watching the light, and you can see right below you that a lot of these are just surface indentations, that can be buff, buffed out. But if it's the darker, deeper black like these, then you're going to have to sand down because that's hitting the real wood. And that wood now is absorbing the dirt and moisture when it gets wet or dirty. So. Can you tell what to buff? Yep. 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 Those black ones, these black ones would still be there if we buffed. Okay. I mean, if you're questioning it, then if you buff, you'd be able to tell it that. Yeah. Find out where you want to place your rug for the next five years and then buff <laughs> underneath that. And if it doesn't come out, leave the rug there and you're set. <laughs> Rugs are the key to success. I was thinking of going back and finishing, you know, refinishing. Yeah. If you tried to buff them, it just wasn't. Yeah, you'd have to do that. If you have slight water spilling, not enough to get the floor and fill the floor, the staining, I'd like to minimize. Minimize. Yeah, get a darker stain. Your, uh, your water spots are not going to show as much. Definitely. Yeah, I could have, when I first, when Tom first told me to do this, I had a PowerPoint idea where I'd go through all wood and all types and everything. Then I realized that'd be 25 hours if you get through laminates and pre-finished. Um, so I could talk about pre-finished too if people want, or laminates, but. If you want to go really briefly over some laminate stuff. Uh, yeah, I mean, so laminate or engineered floor, well, let's go over engineered because in my opinion, nobody should be ever installing laminate. Engineered floor, all it is is a plywood, a cheaper wood, a uh, less expensive wood, underneath a smaller thickness of real wood, the real wood being on top. So this is natural maple. It's the finish and the wood. And then underneath is just cheap wood in general. As you can see from a piece of hickory that's 3 quarters inch down to the tongue, you can sand this. A heck of a lot more than you can sand this. That's why this is less, less expensive. Um, so yeah, that's that's that. If you don't have a lot of traffic in your space and you're tight on money, definitely go for the engineered floor. It's still great because you're getting hard wood, and it just won't last as long. So it's not as sustainable. Being my other major, I like to stick with that. 
Um, Pre-finished flooring, which all three of these large pieces are up here. We have the Asian tiger wood, which is pretty sweet. And then the hickory. And then this is, I think this is, I don't know what this is. But anyways, pre-finished floors. It's like a normal piece of wood where you have the tongue and groove. The only thing is, is when you snap these together and you hit them in and staple them just like you would a normal piece of uh, hardwood before you sand it, you're going to have the gap in between the boards. And depends on how tight you get the boards, depends on the manufacturing of the pre-finished. I don't like it because all I can see is dirt going in those cracks and getting down. The thing with hardwood floors that are finished after they're installed is that you have one consistent level surface across the entire plane of the floor. So the dirt doesn't go in the cracks in between the boards. The dirt goes to the corner where you sweep it. The water doesn't go in between the boards. The water stays in one spot and you wipe it up. So pre-finished is a great idea for a do-it-yourself project. Um, I'm just really biased against it. I'm sorry. Engineered floor is basically a floating floor. What was that? An engineered floor is basically a floating floor? Uh, nope. Uh, an engineered floor, you can get staple down options that are this. A floating floor will have a foam membrane on the back, which is also good in basements if you're around uh, concrete. But a floating floor itself isn't held together by anything but the connections. Um, whereas an engineered floor is stapled down into a subfloor. A floating floor is held at the corners and it floats, it moves back and forth. Okay. Still a good option. I mean. With hardwood flooring, the space from the wall is, depends on your baseboard. Um, bigger the better because wood moves all the time, but we usually leave a uh, eighth of an inch, a quarter of an inch. Um, a floating floor you want to leave less because it moves internally. It's not going to move as much side to side. But especially in Minnesota, floors move a lot with the change in humidity and temperature. Is there a better time of the season since we are in Minnesota to do, uh, to, to redo your floors versus you know, this humidity matter? It's just dry time. Uh, summer it's going to dry, take longer to dry in the winter, it's going to dry faster. Yep, I think I had that on one of the slides, but I didn't talk about it. You also want to. When it comes on, you're good. Oh, yeah, it's dust. You also want to turn off your uh, HVAC unit while it's being sanded so that your return vents don't suck in all the dust. Uh, what we do, we poly over the vent covers even so that dust that we're shooting around doesn't go into the vent covers and then when the system cycles on, it would suck that in. Um, what else? Close your windows, turn off your fans, and we try to tell them that 12 hours after every coat of poly, don't walk on the floor. You can't put rugs after, on a finished floor after two weeks because it takes a long time for it to finish finish drying. If you have a dog, don't have your dog on the floor for a week after. Um, that's more just the safest way to do it. You can obviously have a dog on there the first day. Just don't let it run around and scratch everywhere. But yeah, air movement is not ideal when you're finishing anything, whether it be a floor or furniture. Yep, after about three hours, open the windows and let all the air in you want because it's pretty noxious otherwise. You said to wear a mask. What kind of mask? I wear a dual chamber mask. Uh, you could just wear the cheap white plastic mask too. Whatever affects you. If that's still affecting you with a $2 mask, you can get the $15 3M. I have a 3M two chamber mask that I change the filter sound like every month. But um, it's just what affects you. Mine's super powerful because I do it every day and I hate smelling my own breath in those white masks. Well, thank everybody for coming. If you have any other questions or if you want to check out some stuff up here, I also have business cards from my boss. Um, feel free to take them. Free estimates. Can't say any more. Thank you, Jake. Thanks.